This is James Holder for IFL TV in association with Matt Plins, Jim Marbella. I'm at the MGM Grand today in Las Vegas. It's big fight week. I've just bumped into someone who I've been meaning to get on the channel for a long time. Former featherweight world champion, Kevin Kelly. What's happening, Kev? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Glad to be nice here. to hear, man. That's what I like to hear. Talk to me a little bit about, about what's been going on with you. Going with me? Well, pretty much... Uh... I've been training a football player from here to here. I commentate from time to time. Yeah, I've seen that. Uh, everybody's waiting for me to get on full time, of course, on commentary. So I will come out to Europe if they want me to. Okay. Um, I've been doing HBO International. So you do see me on HBO International. Um, I work for uh, actually, uh, what's that guy's name again, D? Frank Belmont, that's it. And uh, I don't know how I forget that name all the time. But uh, HBO International, you can catch me on there. I'm doing a lot of Glofigan's dates, Granada Glofigan. My manager, K2 Promotion, has him and Klesch Vladimir Klitschko. So I got the deal because my manager has Glafigan. So Is that I Tom Lofer? Tom Lofer, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so he's actually European. He's out there in Germany. I know Tom. He's a good guy. Yeah, he's in I Germany I spent now. a bit of time with him. He's a I was man. actually his first fight he ever had. Wow. Yeah, when he got into the game, uh, I was signed on a company called Mouthpiece with Harlem Warner in, in a league collision, and Tom was brought in to run the boxing department, and I was the first fight he had, and I became world champion like three months after they signed me up. And then I elevated their careers a little bit, and they signed Sugar Shane Mosley and James Tony and John David Jackson. So you were the catalyst for these for, for these impetus for these next signings, really. Yeah, I was. I was. I was the like start. I was the yeah. start. Harlem Warner, who has Muhammad Ali, that's who assigned me. So he has Muhammad Ali, Jim Brown, Joe Namath, Sandy Colfax. Mm -hmm. And if I have an Ali, of course, let you know who he is, right? <laughs> All the stuff in the Fields of Dreams is his, so, you know. So if you got an autograph for Ali, you got it through him. Okay, I can't have you here without talking about, for British fans, one of the most epic nights you was involved in, the night that you fought Prince Nazim Hamid. Can you remember that occasion vividly? Oh yeah, I'm reminded every day of it. I th you know, it, it's strange because that's a fight that I didn't think would be so pivotal in my career. I really didn't because I thought, you know, nobody knew him in America pretty much, you know, we over here, we didn't know about him. He was big over there and I actually went and got him. I traveled overseas to retrieve him to get him to come to America to fight me. I went over there two times. I first, first, matter of fact, three times. I went to challenge Paul Engel first. So Prince is not actually the first one I went to challenge. I went to challenge Paul Engel, but Paul Engel wouldn't fight me. So me going back to fight the Prince, it was something like, okay, good. I need to get him in America and fight me. I, it, it turned into its own, had its own life now. It's strange because I thought, I'm glad it happened, but you know, if I'm amazed I think I would have asked for more money if I, <laughs> I was going to turn into this. You know, I, I just thought, okay, I'm going to blow through it and be done with it and look for the next opponent. Um, at 47-1, and one, and I was undefeated 10 years prior to that, you know, I was running out of opportunities. I was going through everybody. So uh, when I saw the prints in the boxing magazine, I came out of the magazine, I saw him in, uh, seeing them like this, and I was like, I, I thought it was a cartoon, you know, because the way he was, you know, acting and stuff like that. And I said, you know, okay. I told my manager, I said, give me two tickets. And we got to fly over to, to England and, and get this guy. And he said, okay. And I went over there. And the first time they turned me down, Frank Warren did. Uh, Prince had, you know, he, they were doing their thing over there in England. And I give him credit. Um, and I came back. I fought one more fight. And then I said, you know what? I heard he wanted to come to America. And they heard he said they'll fight me. So I left and went to a plane, got a plane. And I went to fight. They fought uh, Jose Bedelio, I think it was. And that's a knock and stopping ball, Jose Bedelio. Because I thought, I thought, because I love Europe because it's a great show over there. Okay, I, I think y'all do things better than we do them over here in America. Because we have so much going on, they don't focus as much on one event. And when y'all have boxing with lasers, because a lot of my career, people don't know this, was actually done in Europe. Because mm -hmm. my manager signed Rogelio Tor, who's from Holland. So I fought in Holland, like, what, six times a year. And I fought in Belgium, I fought in Warragam. I was all over the place in Europe. So I like Europe. And I, I still got a custom, guys, thank you for this custom, where I carbonate all my drinks. And I got that from Europe, and I tell my mom, now I got my wife doing it over there, right? Where she carbonates a lot of her drinks. And I got it from Europe because they always say with goss. So being nice, that's what I got. So I got some European customs, and I do like Europe. I mean, when Nazi made his, interest, his intro to that fight, it was his first time in America fighting. Yeah. What was going through your head when he took like near on nine minutes to get into the ring? What was you thinking then? A lot of people don't know. We had a contract. See, I had the advantage because I went over there twice. I know what he does. I watched it twice. That's what he does. He walks to the ring. So we put a contract stated clause that we're going to give him 20 minutes to come to the ring. Anything over that, I'm going to get a lot of money in a minute. I'm talking, I ain't going to disclose it, but it was a lot of money signed in the contract. So what happened was, people don't notice, when he was dancing behind us doing a solo, the pyro was supposed to go off, and it never went off. 
And I guess wow. Prince realized that he's going to pay me, and he broke the paper himself. <laughs> <laughs> and we talked about it, right? He was waiting for the cue by HBO yeah. to send him out. But the pyro was supposed to like flame. It was supposed to be a flame. The pyro was supposed to flame the paper. And it never flamed, so he had to tear through the paper, too. Okay. So when he did that, I'm used to it. People think, you know, I just, my, to add more excitement for the visitor, okay, and for the spectator, my trainer was like in a ring telling me, encourage the fire at the crowd, you know, act like he, he's holding you up, you know. It's, it's all stage and performance, you know, smoke and marriage, as I call it. So I knew he was going to do that. Cause people, of course, if I know he's going to do that. I went over to England. I watched the man twice. That's what he does every time, right? Of course I know he does that, okay? So it, I knew I was expected of it. It was nothing new, nothing different. We have in America, we didn't like Prince, the first one to do it. We had Paez do it. We had Camacho do it. So in America, they, there's nothing you can do that's new. It's repetitive, yeah, yeah. okay? With Dante Wilder, Wilder talking like, like Muhammad Ali yesterday, okay, he talked like Muhammad Ali. People, Americans miss certain things, and when you come back many, many years later, it seems new to them. It's just like Tyson. When Tyson came up, black shorts, okay, that came from the 50s. So, so everything's repetitive, okay? It's just that when you have that gap where it doesn't happen for a while and you do it again, it's something new to people, okay? Mm -hmm. I was an extension of Sugar Ray and watching Hagler and watching Hearns and Matthew Sal Muhammad and watching Sugar Ray Robinson. I was an extension of what they were doing. Uh, more of the gentlemen, I, and I got that from those guys and how to be a proper champion, to be well-respected and loved. You know, you can be loved or hated. Which one do you want to be? Okay, in America, Floyd likes to be hated. He says, you know why? Because whether you hate me or love me, you're going to watch me, and that's all that counts. Retired in 2009. Uh, it seemed, doesn't seem that long ago, to be honest. Have, yeah, you, have you spoke to any of like Prince Nazim since, since then? Do he you calls keep in contact me all the time. He calls me all the time. Um, for good friends, it's funny. When you have fights like that, you become best friends. It's like a bully situation in school. Of course. A guy bullies you, and then all of a sudden you fist fight him, and then all of a sudden now you're best friends. Yeah, but you did talk to all right? 10 years after the fight. On your 10-year anniversary, he called yeah, he you. Yeah, call, he called me. But he had called me out before that, but I, I no. missed the call, I think. No, because he was upset with you. Oh, uh, he was upset with what me. What was the reason he was upset with you for, Kim? See, I met, see, in America, you know, he just ran into my, my mouth. I'm a mouth before. He was, he's mouthing off. I've been mouthing off way before he was mouthing off. He should know that. Right? And he should know that I can hold, hold up with him. You know what I'm saying? It's not a big thing with me. Mm -hmm. right? I'm from New York. The dozens and all put down games, that's what we do. We talk mad trash about you. You know what I'm saying? We can do that. We, we didn't talk. So, and I was doing that before. Okay, that's how I challenged my opponents. I talk trash with my opponents all the time. So when I seen them do it, I was like, I wasn't going to equal them. I was going to let them not talk trash. Right? That's why the interview on, on TV, you see, when I jumped in the ring and I told him, he was like, Tell me your New York accent, Kevin Kelly, right? And I said, hey, knock it off, right? And I would tell him things, right? And I said, it's okay. You know what I'm saying? It's funny, you might laugh at that. But the thing is, I can call him all kinds of things. And he sometimes, when I was calling him things in New York City, he didn't realize what I was calling him, right? And then later on, the next day he saw me, he, he was giving me the finger at me because, because he figured out what I was talking about. Because in New York City, it's a different stigma than the rest of the world. In New York City, a lot of... Uh, Arabics and Muslims and aliens work in 7-Eleven, right? So it's just a joke, right? It's not a racist thing. It's just a joke, right? So when I said it to him, I guess he saw it, you know, saying anything I was talking about. And I said, you can work at 7-Eleven, right? Give me a super slurpee, you know, stuff like that. It's just a joke. But Americans understand it. But he didn't get it right away. So, but when he got, figured it out, that he was mad at me, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, but, but you know, he said, I, was, I didn't talk to you 10 years. I was upset at things you said to me. I said, you know, all the things you said to me, I'm like, really? No, he was upset because you said he was not the hardest guy, the hardest puncher you ever faced. No, nah, he wasn't. And he wasn't. He wasn't. And he Who was, was really Barrera? upset. No. Who was? I fought Barrera with a rib injury. Um, yeah. I was very in bad shape when I fought Barrera. I didn't make Who was the hardest puncher you faced? I think Goya Vargas. Okay. Um, you know, punch and power is perception. People don't realize something. Um, punch and power is always perception to everybody. So you, I can fight the same guy and a opponent of mine and say, well, I fought him. He ain't hit that hard to me. You know? In my punch of Paul's perception, okay? Um, I know fighting him that I was the hardest punch he faced. I knew that after I dropped him the first few times and I knew I, my punch of power, right? And I always told in an interview, I told him many times, I said, listen, if you're the hardest punch of featherweight, right, they're saying right now in the game, I said, I'm going to be the hardest punch of featherweight in the history because my guys don't get up. When I was featherweight, you didn't move. When I hit you, you were down. It was over. I mean, I crumbled guys. Gainer, um, I knocked out so many champ, so many champions, and when I and I was saying so, I, I was never really keen on my punching power. My thing was my speed. I loved my speed. That was my biggest possession. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of think me and Ahmed were kind of equals. He just had the age on me, 
but we were equals. Um, we both switch, fight righty, fight lefty. So we kind of neutralized each other. Mm-hmm. So the advantage was, uh, my trainer said to me one day, the, the craziest thing, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. He said, Kevin, let me ask you a question. How would you beat yourself? I never thought about that. He said, because that's what you're going to be fighting, yourself. And I said, I never thought. But you're going to fight yourself a little bit open with more opportunities. And my trainer told me when Prince leaps, he sleeps. And that was our motto because he does leave the ground. Though he does things wrong, but they work. A very unorthodox. Yeah, but I'm unorthodox too. Mm-hmm. I do things. My style is Jeet Kune Do. So when I told the prince, I said, you know, just that remind me of Drunken Monkey. And that's what we related him to in the gym we are training for the fight. That how would I beat Drunken Monkey? Because my style is Mantis Kung Fu. People don't notice. I'll divulge it now. I'm retired. My whole style is not really boxing. It's Jeet Kune Do. Bruce Lee's techniques. I studied Wing Chunk. I studied Shotokan. Um, tai Chi breathing, long arm, short arm Tai Chi. I, I fight more like a martial artist. You found all that stuff was helpful to your boxing career, didn't My you? whole style was that style. Yeah. And I just I just implemented it in boxing. But my whole style was really Jeet Kune Do. Parrying shots, moving, okay. A lot of things I did, I used to train a, a dojo. My sure. people don't know, Phil was, a, he trained Paul Vizio, who's a nine-time kickboxing champion of the world. Nine times. So martial arts was always around me. It was always part of what Phil did. I was in a boxing train. I do Wing Chun. If I throw a shot, that's why I throw a backhand, okay? That's Wing Chun, See, okay? You're giving it all this Wing Chun thing, but I've heard a rumor you're not the toughest man in your own house. No, never. What have you got Absolutely to say about not. that? Absolutely not. Of course he knows. Well, well, she's not the toughest either. <laughs> is it, so, is he, it true he, you he, had seven pro he, fights? He knows. He no, knows that I, I'm the president of the house, period. Wow. No, we he got knows somebody it. tougher than Hunter. We got a two-year-old in oh, Legacy. Yeah, he's... He runs the house. No, he's vice president. No, he's president. he's vice president. I'm the president. He's the vice president. Is it true you had seven professional fights? Six. Six. Yeah. But no more. We got babies. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's that right there. So I'll let you know if you actually get mad at me anyway. But that's Dana White's cousin right there. UFC no, president. No, it's not. Her aunt, her aunt and his her father dated 18 years. Okay. And she don't like to they say it. They were never but, married. They were never married, but they used to train her. Train her. That's yeah. how I got into boxing was because Dana trained me. Yeah, he was an amazing kind of boxing trainer. That's and an interesting trainer. story in itself. He was amazing. We got footage of it at home uh, in training. Yeah. We have footage via just footage of it. It's like, that's, you know, that's her little tiny her little moment in the light there, you know. In other words, you don't get them all the time. <laughs> 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 Do you ever have any aspirations to train fighters yourself or maybe give a little bit back to the sport? Is that nah. something you thought me, about? Me, my big thing to sport is broadcasting. Yeah. You're telling yeah, you what's you're going on. You're built for that. You're built for that. I don't feel even watching some fighters. I'm a couple competitor. We've got other commentators that fight. Uh, I'm a lot more detailed. See, I started on the radio. I started actually, in, I started commentating actually in 1989 or 90. Um, I, the first fight I did was the hardest fight. Once I did that, I, I didn't plan on commentating. But what happened was you find it, it finds you. You don't find it. Uh, I, got, I got a call one day when George Foreman was fighting Holyfield, a radio station in New York City called The Fan. And they called me up and they said, Kevin, would you like to come down and broadcast? And I said, yes. When I got there, I know how big the task was going to have to be. They said, well, this is what you got to do. You got to see the fight and call it two seconds later. I said, what? What do you mean? They said, well, it's illegal to do a pay-per-view event on the radio. So you got to watch what you're seeing, right? Commentate what you saw. And then remember what you saw so you can say that. I said, what? I was, I was nervous. I was, first time I ever been on the microphone, I was very, very nervous. So, and then I was hoping, I said, you know what? George Foreman, totally felt it's going to be a knockout. I'll get three, four rounds in, right? I get out of this thing. <laughs> they want to fight in 12 rounds. After I did that, I guess my tr- promoter heard it, and other people started hearing it in New York City and loved it. I got hired for Heavyweight Explosion, which I did for eight years. I've commentated everybody in heavyweights except for Mike Tyson. I've done Holyfield, I've done Foreman, I've done Rockman, I've done all. When they were coming up, 3 0, 4 0, I was doing their fights. I was traveling around the country. So I was boxing. My career was obviously in its, in its heyday. I was like 15, 16 0. And I was getting to the top 10. I was coming to the best fight in the world. But at the same time, that's, I, I developed this career of broadcasting. And then I have my own TV show on HBO. You probably saw it in Europe called Kill Nation. I did that for two years. I was doing, at one point, I, people don't know, I'm going to look at my record. I retired for two years because I had too many TV shows I had to do. Wow. So I was doing Kill Nation, HBO, Whisper One Radio, and I was doing Heavyweight Explosion at the same time. The reason I came back to box, I was able to come back because I thought, well, you know what? <sighs> If this stays like this or gets worse, then I'm going to have to just quit. I was training, but I just couldn't really get ready for a fight. So what I did was when I lost two shows, I went back to boxing. You know, okay, because I'm first love, you know. Mm-hmm. So I went back to boxing. But I still kept commentating. I, was, I did CSI Sports. 
I work for HBO International now. So I still do other events, and I'm trying to get on with you guys, maybe BBC, Sky TV. Yeah. Um, Box the, Nation. Don't yeah. forget Box Nation. Yeah, talk to you guys. Because at the end of the day, people need to know what's going on. Like last night, you know, it was a matter of... Let's talk about it, man. What did yeah. we see last night? Tell last me how night, you, Tell me, break it down for me in fight okay. analyst style, Kevin. All right. Let's go to work. What I would have said on the air, it was very different what was said. It wasn't so much what Dante was doing. It was what Berman wasn't doing. See, boxing matches, and I was thinking about this. Boxing matches are based on this. You got two men of equal value coming to the ring, right? And what happens is each man has to find a way to shut that guy's, whatever he trained to do, shut it down. So he has to go in his religious sources and find something else to win. So what happens is I take away the jab, which Berman should have did, took away the jab, which may not be a takeaway. It's very simple. If he, Dante Wilder has a very good jab. He should have parried it, which means block it, and shoot his own jab. Or make a miss and then throw your jab. Okay? You cut the distance between you and the taller man. There's rules in boxing that Berman didn't follow yesterday. Basics. A tall man that's taller than you can never fight going backwards. You take away his leverage. Okay? He had, he had Dante going backwards, but he didn't take away the advantage. Because what happens is when you take away the advantage, push him backwards, it takes away his punching power. Only way Dante Wilder had punching power is when he went forward. If he, every time he went back, was he caught Berman, he never heard him. Give Berman his due. He did not stop yeah. coming forward the whole fight. But you see, see, going forward, anybody can push you back. Mm -hmm. But you got to be pushing back effective. Do you think see, he might not realize that Deontay hits that hard? He might not believe the height. The thing is, Dante hits hard. He's a heavyweight. So does Berman. Mm -hmm. But once you, you, you try to neutralize his best asset, the jab and the big right hand. Yeah. Once I eat your jab and I take that away from you, then I neutralize your right hand by slipping this way, okay, or parrying, okay, and I let you hit me with the right hand. It's, fighting is, people don't understand this, it's not physical. It's 90% psychological. 10% physical. See, all the guys are in the same shape. Both of them did 12 rounds, Dante and, Flo, and, and, and uh, Berman. The difference is, is that Dante got so relaxed in what he was doing, and Berman never initiated the second step, which means the second step was he didn't give Berman something else to think about. I want to make you uncomfortable when I'm running. That was my job. With the Prince was to make him uncomfortable. Okay? The problem was once I got comfortable, that's when he caught me with the last punch. And then I realized I was trying to slow down. So Berman had to do the same thing with Dante. He had to make him uncomfortable but by taking away the jab. Punching on him. Dante put his arm on him like this, he should have punched his arm right here. Okay? After two or three rounds of punching that arm like this, he's not bringing the arm no more. So now I separate the distance that we have. That's what I've been talking about last night. Why was Dante allowed to do it? Why wasn't Berman neutralizing? So I would have talked, I like to talk when I commentate more from the guy that's losing than the guy that's winning. And a lot of commentators talk from the guy that's winning, but I always like to talk to the guy about the guy that's the underdog because I want people to root for him, right? Because the other guy's winning. And when I was winning fights, I hope you rooted for the underdog a little bit because he come back to beat me, right? That's what makes fighting exciting. Levels. Last night we saw one level happen. Dante came out and got away with one level all night long. He never had to feel uncomfortable. He never had to change the way he was doing. And Berman just had it. It's called feet in the sand. I believe the man overtrained. My trainer, Don House, trains him too. And I know Don House knows how to cut the ring off, neutralize the jab. And last night, I didn't see that. I give my hat goes over to Dante Wilder because you, you fought exactly where he was to fight. If he fought inside, that was the wrong fight. He needed to fight outside, use a long jab, a straight right hand, and, and, and keep moving. And that's exactly what I would have told Dante Wilder against Berman. And I would have told Berman the other thing, cut the ring off, Neutralize his jab, okay, and his fight's easier for you. But Dante, I can applaud Dante Wilder for fighting up here, and I can't applaud Berman for fighting. <laughs> He's right down here. So that's what I saw last night. But we still have a question mark on Dante Wilder. Um, he, one thing he answered that he can go past, he can go distance now. He got rid of that question. Nobody think the question of his chin being questionable has now been answered as well, having been rocked a couple of times by, 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 by Bermain during the fight. Yeah, but no follow up. Um, Berm, Bermain, I think. He, I don't know he could punch, but the difference was there was no follow-up, and it was grazing punches. Nothing solid. I didn't see Dante really get with anything really solid. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I don't believe he's ready for Klitschko, though. I was, this, is, this is the last thing no. I was going to ask you before no. we wrap this up, because no. I've got to go and get on a plane. and uh, Not ready for Klitschko. This is the last thing. Do you, do, you, do you think he can sort of improve to get to that level with Klitschko, or is Klitschko still... still well ahead of the and the rest of the we, rest we of got the we got to see you know it's a growing curve now see becoming champion is one thing but when you become champion that's when the boxing really starts people don't realize something mm -hmm. it's not it's not 
Becoming champion. It's hard. Don't get me wrong. The hardest part to do. But when you become champion, everything changes. Because now you're an entity. Now it's about money. It's about putting you on a big stage. All this other stuff comes in that wasn't there before. And that's why a lot of fighters fail victim to. The marketing. We're going to see what Dante can do against all the pressure that's going to come now. Because now, before, that expectation to become champion. You know, the whole thing, I hope, I hope, I hope. Yeah. But now he's champion. Now you got to perform. So he becomes a target as well now for the, yes, rest, bulls on the rest of the world. Yes, bullseye on your back. What I did when I was boxing was when I became champion, I put the bullseye on my opponent's back. Like he had the belt. I never felt like I was champion. I always kept myself like, okay, you got the belt. I got to go get it. And that's the way I fought. Um, even if, you know, Dante now is going to, like I said, it's a transformation. You go from average boxer, contender, to now you're the man and and everybody's, you know, predator and prey. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And if Dante is like stays the same way he stayed going to this fight, he'll be very, 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 very successful because he's got to think that he's still not got given the credibility. That's what keeps Floyd alive. You're not giving it to him, okay? When you do a takeaway from Floyd, you tell him, "Ah, oh, you know, I like I don't hate the way you hate you. I don't like the way you fight." And that's why Floyd fights the way he does because he's not accepted yet by the world that you are the best, and he is the best. So as long as you're not accepted by the best, you're gonna fight for something. I gotta give you something to fight for. And once they tell you you're the best, you have nothing to fight for. That's why even in 2009, when I tell you, I retired. I felt I had nothing left to prove. Okay, I've done it over. And I didn't do it one time. I've done it four, five, six, seven times. So after a point, it comes to a point where you just want to shut it down and say, you know what? I got to move on to another part of my life. And that's the microphone. So listen, I look forward to seeing the second and third part of your journey and seeing what, what life has in store for Kevin Kelly, you know? We'd like to see you in the UK, whether it's in a sports analyst uh, sports analyst position or a commentary position, whatever the case may be. It'd be great to see you giving a little bit back to the sport. You know? Well, I'm doing it over there. I'm doing HBO International, so obviously you're getting me. Mm -hmm. I heard I'm in Peru. I'm heard in all these other countries. As, uh, I don't know what station I'm be on, but I've been doing it with Bob Papa. No, no, um, Frank, ben, Frank, Frank Belmont. No, that's what I work for. I've been commentating with those that <laughs> Not about pop, I'm thinking. <laughs> I forgot, I had him. I, I talked about it earlier. Anyway, I got a picture of my phone somewhere about him. But he works in his analysis. And, and I'm looking forward to it because, like I said, I want to bring, like I brought to boxing, something different, something new. That's what I thought I was doing. You know, I'm here not to bring what was happened before. Ji Kwon Do is like Bruce Lee Styles, bring something new, something fresh. Mm -hmm. um, I watch what everybody does, broadcast and commentary, and I feel... I bring something uniquely new. When I did the Kill Nation, I don't know if y'all saw it out there in Europe, Kill Nation, that was actually the first hip-hop boxing show. It was made to promote hip-hop with boxing. It was way rad. It was crazy. It, it was new. It was fresh. It was brash. Um, by me doing that, I showed flexibility, I think. And I look to continue that in the future. All right. Well, listen, I wish you the best of luck. I Thank wish you good health in what you're doing. Thank you for talking to IFL TV. Thank you, I really you appreciate hanging out with you guys. And uh, I'll catch you again real soon. Thank you. Nice to have you. Kevin Kelly, salute, sir.